All right, the glasses have finally made an appearance in a YouTube video. I just couldn't take any more of my contacts. I was, these, I had to take them out. They were driving me crazy. They were dry and you know, the contacts wearers, you know what I mean? So the ring light reflection is gonna drive me crazy. The glasses are here and they're, you know, <laughs> the relief. Um, I'm still in a food coma. I have been saying that since the last two videos because I have been recording these videos back to back, hence why the clothes are the same. I am not gonna change my clothes for a new video. You know, people do that. <laughs> Let's stop. Book review time. <laughs> okay, so this week's book review is going to be Cleopatra and Frankenstein by my girl Coco Mellers. And this is a debut and it was released this year, I want to say in February. And there was just, I mean, the cover was striking. I just couldn't resist. And the name I thought was compelling. And I mean, even Miss Coco Mellers has a name that is quite compelling. So I was like, I need it now. And so, um, also I have incorporated this into my millennial fiction reading project, which I keep saying I'm going to do a video about. So you have more detail about what I'm doing. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah. So I will do eventually a video, video on that. I have so much content to make as far as, um, book reviews go. I have a stack of books. I have more books. I'm finishing books faster than I can review them. Good problem to have. I need to stop rambling. Hi, my name is Alana and on this channel we review books. I review books mainly. I think I prefer to do the one video dedicated to a book because it really allows me to dig deep into the um the book and its themes and all the other stuff. I'm kind of digging the glasses. It makes me feel smarter than I am. All right. Let's jump into this one. So it frightened her how easy it was to fake her own happiness. Cleopatra and Frankenstein by Coco Mellers tells the story of Cleo and Frank, Cleo and Frank's whirlwind relationship. And I don't mean that in a good way. There, after randomly meeting in New York City on New Year's Eve, they quickly get married. However, the cracks in their relationship become visible visible very very quickly mellers shows how hasty decisions have a ripple effect on not only cleo and frank or the two people that decide to make this decision but with those within their sphere mellers shows that cleo and frank's relationship is fragile very early on in the novel I have seen a few reviews, several reviews actually, that complain that the first couple of chapters are too cliche for them, cringy, and then they give up. However, it is possible to me, this is how I saw it, to view this novel as the antithesis of to the romance novel. We have a narrative about two people who are clearly attracted to each other, and it, but yet they do not have a happily ever after. Too much real life inserts itself in very quickly. It's also kind of one of those narratives that asks the question, well, you know, a lot of rom-coms or romance stories, even Disney is, does, has done this a lot, especially with the cartoon retellings like Cinderella, the old ones, you know, Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty and all that stuff. Snow White, they, it, it fades to black after they write at their wedding. And then you're thinking, oh, and they live happily ever after. False, they don't because real life will smack you in the face. I'm a realist. <laughs> um, and so this is what happens. This is the story of what happens to relationships after the wedding. And now Frank and Cleo's story is extreme in some cases, but they definitely don't. Yeah, I, I don't want to be either of these people. <laughs> I don't envy any of these characters. They're all a mess. All of them are a hot mess. Hot. Hot and stinky. All right. Um, I need to calm down. It's the glasses. It's the Peter Barker glasses. All right. Let's, let's, let's dive into another quote. <laughs> the whole thing had been presented as a caprice, a giddy impersonation of adulthood. It wasn't unreasonable for Chloe who had just turned 25, but Frank was in his mid forties, too old, he thought, to consider himself too young to be married. Mellers makes it, like I said, Mellers makes it very evident that very on, on in the novel, um, Cleo and Frank, there's quite a bit wrong in their relationship. 
and also Cleo and Frank and many of their friends are full blown drug addicts and they have issues with alcohol use. She does not shy away from substance abuse and alcohol use in this novel. And she shows how this lifestyle is extremely destructive. And while showing that it's destructive, she is visceral with it. She is unapologetic. She goes into detail about the uses of these substances. And I, and, and that was also a, a problem that a lot of people had with this book or what they personally did not like. They felt that it was too graphic when it came to substance use. But I mean, you know how I like my, my literature. I like it blunt and I like it, you know, that's just me. <laughs> but I, a lot of people, I've read reviews where they, they didn't care for that. But for me, that didn't bother me. Actually, not much bothers me. Maybe that's a personal problem. Many of these characters are quite blind to how their reliance on substances has numbed them. They cannot objectively see how, so they cannot really see the wake of the destruction that they um, are causing to themselves and to others because they are so ingrained um, in this culture of substance abuse. Um, until they step away. And there are some characters in this book who do step away from substance use. And you, it's like the veil has been lifted and they can clearly see and they can, it's almost like they can think and feel clearly for the first time. However, there are characters also that, I'm not going to spoil which one, but there's a character in particular who, how Mellers writes it, you assume that they never get out of that pit of um, substance abuse. And it's, it's really rather sa- sad because they're so blind to it or in denial to of it that they just other they're pushing other people away from them speaking of characters cleopatra and frankenstein features a colorful class of characters and in a way they almost read like caricatures and i think that miller said that on purpose in another setting these characters would be jarring because they are some of them are a little over the top but they're not really like there are people like, oh, I know people like that. Like the just personality wise, how they dress, how they talk. But in 2007, New York City as a setting, these characters make perfect sense. Coco Mellers, who had lived in, she's, she's English, but since 15, she's, since she was 15 years old, she uh, was in New York City and now she currently lives in LA. She has her finger at the pulse of the people that you find in New York City I mean some of these characters I mean you could you you you're gonna see them in the subway or on the train you're going to see them walking around Manhattan or Bronx or Brooklyn these are people I think she knows exactly what she was doing when she created these characters and for again for some reviews some people thought the characters were just not believable but I'm like have you been to the train at night girl (laughs) <laughs> yeah she ain't making this up my favorite character is Santiago he is a friend of Cleo and Frank's he's really Frank's friend and then through marriage he becomes acquainted with Cleo and he's a he's a restaurant owner who has um some successful restaurants in New York City and Santiago's love language is food obviously he's a restaurant owner he is a foodie and there is this really delicious passage that that Mellers writes about him making Spanish rice pudding. Listen to this. It was what his grandmother made him for him back in Lima when he had a hard time at school. To sweeten your grief, she would say. She boiled the rice in the milk and added a cinnamon stick, watching the thick, creamy mixture mixture swirl against the wooden spoon. His grandmother told him that his ancestors in Babylon made this dish thousands of years ago, sweetening the mixture with honey and dates. Today, he would make it the way she had taught him, with vanilla and orange peel. He added the condensed milk and inhaled the cloud of sweet steam that enveloped him. It was not necessary for Mellers to write this about Santiago 
making rice pudding. But she did, and I'm glad that she did. Because one, homegirl either looked up a recipe on how to make Spanish rice pudding, or she watched it on YouTube, or she has had authentic rice pudding, Spanish rice pudding, and knew exactly how to write about it. Because I could, my mouth was watering when I read, first read that passage. I was like, I want some, <laughs> okay? Give me some. And what I like about why she wrote that when it wasn't really necessary is she does things like that to add more depth to her characters. We know that Santiago is a restaurant owner and that he loves food, but this background, a few sentences, this little paragraph of him in the process of making rice pudding for Cleo added just a little bit extra to the character. And I think that she hit the nail on the head. She does that with other characters with their interests here or there, the clothes that they're wearing or or etc. And it just adds character development in a way that doesn't feel contrived, but is so subtly done, you almost don't notice that she's doing it. Also, with this cast of characters, so the way that this book is constructed is you're mainly focusing on Cleo and Frank, Cleo and Frank, but you do get the point of view of a few other characters. So you get Santiago in the third person, you get Quentin in the third person, who is one of Cleo's good friends. You get a character named Eleanor. Eleanor is the only character you get in the first person, which is really interesting uh, writing choice that Mellor's made. I haven't figured out exactly why I think that she did that. I have some, I have some thoughts, but they're not set in stone yet. It's percolating, so I'm not gonna elaborate. But, um and how all of these narratives and how they interact and how they feel and they think about Cleo and Frank kind of come together as one narrative. Um, with all of these characters, all of these characters in a way are striving for uniqueness or value or purpose in their own way. And it's funny how and she, Miller's addresses this phenomenon of how when you're striving for uniqueness, you often can end up becoming a cliche. And this does pose an interesting question. So how can a, how unique can a person truly be? And does there still have to be a level of commonality among groups of people to still make them ad identifiable as active members within a society or a community? Can a person truly have a unique persona? You can always recognize an art student anywhere in the world, he thought. The quest for individuality had resulted in the opposite, complete predictability. Another interesting question that I think that Cleopatra and Frankenstein asks is, how do we write and consume narratives that highlight difficult or traumatic topics, topics and events? Um, again, there is stuff in this book that Mellors doesn't shy away from. Um, and again, that's a literary choice. Some people do not like their narratives that way. They don't like things to be too blunt or too graphic. They want to kind of fill in, fill in the details for themselves, which I think is fine. I don't mind it depending on how it's done. It didn't bother me here. It didn't bother me in a little life. But um, there's an interesting uh, uh a sentence here it says the contestants make turns tearfully recounting their stories in front of a wall advertising an energy drink so i mean it's, it's not uncommon for companies to profit off of other people's trauma it is a way it's a really a form of emotional manipulation um, because you're pulling at the consumer's heartstrings and, and thus it makes the brand look like they're a compassionate brand, but the ultimate goal is still to sell the product. Um, so what makes the novel different? Is the novel any different? Um, there are novels that take advantage of trauma and put it in a narrative for the sake for in a narrative for the sake of shock value. I know people who do not like what's called trauma bonding in books in which characters bond over mutual trauma. That again, that doesn't bother me because trauma bond bonding as a plot device act this is a side note, but it doesn't bother me because 
it's realistic. People do this all the time. Whether or not you think it's okay, people do this all the time. I had a joke with a coworker um, who shall remain unnamed, who uh, was working in a very difficult work environment. And he was saying how him and another colleague, they're in the same department, it actually brought them closer together because they're like, at least we could rely on each other in this horrible work environment. And I would joke and was like, well, trauma can sometimes bring people together when you can relate, right? So that's why trauma bonding doesn't bother me. Um, But I can see why some people don't like it as a plot device. Um, Like I said, I think what's interesting about Cleopatra and Frankenstein is that it is a story that's very direct and unapologetic in the way that it handles difficult topics. Mellers does not beat around the bush at all. Um, but I still don't feel like it's contrived. Um, there are viewers who would disagree with me and that's fine. Uh, but there is, but for me, there's just nothing about human nature that shocks me at this point. And so um, when authors want to write about it, do you boo boo? Whether or not um the content makes some people uncomfortable, especially with the alcohol and drug use. There are people who live lives like this. Um, I have listened to many of interviews of people who were substance abusers and there's just stuff in this book. I was like, is Coco Miller's watching the same document series, interview series that I watch because this sounds like these people. So there's that. Again, some people don't care for it, but to each their own. One of my favorite themes in literature is how we're switching gears though yeah one of my favorite themes in literature is how the mundane will always permeate extreme events in life and I think that's why more and more these slice of life slice of life narratives are becoming increasingly popular so I've mentioned a character Eleanor whose only narrative or point of view in this book is told in the first person from her from her perspective she's a woman who works with Frank And she has an ailing father. And in the height of her father's decline, a list of to-dos is still running through her head. I need to make money. I need to write today. I need to clean the bathroom. I need to eat something. I need to quit sugar. I need to cut my hair. I need to call Verizon. I need to savor the moment. I need to find the library card. I need to learn to meditate. I need to try harder. I need to get that stain out. I need to find better health insurance. I enjoyed that because I think that is highly relatable. How many times are you stressed about something, whether that's at work or something's going on in your personal life with family or friends or a loved one or whatever the case may be, your car just broke down, you're stuck on the side of the road, whatever, and you're still thinking, I still need to get home and do the laundry. I still have to make dinner. I have, there's the little details and the the things that make up everyday life still have to get done and they're constantly going on in the back of my mind I think that's another reason why that's relatable because look at when lockdowns first happened um in 2020 um in the midst of all of this weirdness and uncertainty and in some ways chaos um everyday life there were elements of life that still had to continue so for me I was considered an essential worker because my department handles things that has to get done then Coco Mellers just fell on the floor. If we don't do them, uh, the city's going to start falling apart, literally. Um, <laughs> so in the midst of this weirdness, um, it was still the everyday routine of work and cooking and cleaning and going to the grocery store and doing this stuff in this weird environment. And I think that's highly relatable. Um, residents were still cursing us out because they were like, Come get this bulk waste pickup. I've got trees in the front yard. I'm like, calm down, okay? If a storm hits, we still have to work. So the infrastructure of society still has to function. That's my little tangent. Another thing I really enjoyed in this book, and again, it's something that some people, reviews that I saw did not like, but I liked it. It was her writing style. Some people thought her writing style was not that great. I enjoyed Miss Meller's writing style. I thought it was straightforward and witty. Some I saw one promo of this for this book 
comparing her to um, if you hear a fan or some whirring sound that is my whirring sound that is my laptop comparing her to Sally Rooney side note can we stop comparing every millennial author or debut author to Sally Rooney she is nothing like Sally Rooney and I mean that as a compliment I am not a Sally Rooney fan of her writing I'm, I'm just not but she this is a different style of writing let coco mellers be coco mellers and stop comparing her to sally rooney i understand why they do that for promo because it's like if you like this you might like this it's all marketing and advertising i totally get it but she is not sally rooney she is something different with the way that she writes and i'm going to end the rant and proceed with why i'm arguing this <laughs> um some people also felt her writing was cliche i disagree i think that she nails writing dialogue the conversations in this novel feel very organic the reading her conversations are it feels like watching a ping pong match the characters are just lines are going back and forth and there's a cadence to it she nails linguistics and the nuances of speech and casual conversation and she even nailed some of the slang that would have been prevalent in 2007 like one of the characters says no dice and i'm like yo i haven't heard that in a long time but that's very 2007 coco mellers knows what she's doing um and so i often um some of the dialogue in here is actually some of my favorite pieces of writing within this book she also uses really interesting similes and metaphors making comparison and using imagery that I have never read before and it was extremely effective. She felt as if she had taken a knife to the surface of the sky, skimmed a little off the bottom and worn the peel. That is describing a dress that Cleo was wearing that was like a a blue, a light blue silk or satin slip dress. So that's how she described that and I thought that was like chef's kiss. Clusters of people sat around little wooden tables outside, releasing bubbles of conversation and laughter that popped against Cleo's skin. Again, I loved that. I thought it was well done. I, some people thought her writing was bad. I'm like, no, if I have um, watched a couple of interviews of Coco Miller talking about her book, um, and she has a passion for language and literature. And she was talking about some of these great works of fiction that she's read, like Moby Dick or whatever. So there was even an article recently that she wrote talking about language um, and linguistics and um, how how you speak can kind of, I'm paraphrasing a lot, but um, how you speak kind of can make you an outsider in some ways because she was a teenager in New York with a British accent or an English accent. And so she kind of talked about that and how language can does affect how people interact with you so you can I, I I could tell at least that Coco Millers has a passion for language and how it's used all right I'm about to wrap this up because I'm raving <laughs> a lot and ranting I had a bit of a rant in there about comparing Sally Rooney to people too many times all right <laughs> so before I, I'm going to wrap this up before I wrap this up there was a three beat a three beat in this novel that I notice and if you're unfamiliar with a three beat the last time I talked about a three beat was when I was re reviewing Outlander um so a three beat is a device that's used in novels movies and shows where a theme is thrown or shown three times typically these three beats will show some type of type of arc within a theme maybe a compare and contrast within a theme and in this book there are three mothers um, and so we have Cleo's mother who is no longer alive again none of these are spoilers or you find it out very quickly Frank's mother who was alive but not really present in Frank's life it's a bit of a strained relationship and then we have Eleanor's mother who is extremely present in Eleanor's life through these mothers Mellers is highlighting the impact that these the mother-child relationship has on these characters and on people as a whole, I think. So if you're a person who likes to explore mother-daughter relationships or mother-child relationships, that theme within narratives, there is a, there's your three beat, three mothers. I think that would be interesting for you to uh, 
it would be an interesting reason, I think, to pick up this book. I'm going to put this down. Overall, I enjoyed Cleopatra and Frankenstein, if you couldn't tell. I found it to be a really interesting novel. I haven't read anything quite like it. Um, it I found it to be compulsively readable and I flew through it. It also, like I said, it's visceral and unapologetic and I like narratives like that. And it's something that I personally seek out in my novels. I also appreciated how Mellers concluded this story. It was executed well and it was fair. It, again, this is a not necessarily a happily ever after narrative. Um, because again, she creates this tension between Frank and Cleo very early on in the novel. And you're wondering how is this going to conclude? And the way it could conclude makes perfect sense. I enjoyed the ending. I think, yeah, I really enjoyed the ending. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to Miller's future novels. I know that she is currently writing her second novel. And I am going to definitely pick that up when it hits shelves. And she, because of this book, and it is a de debut novel, debut novels typically um you can see some uh, typically with an author's debut novel you can see how there may be some things there that may be a little rough around the edges but i think it's the debut novel is a good way to see an author's potential and i'm like okay well where do we go from here and you know I'm excited to see where Miller's writing goes in the future. And she has become an automatic buy author for me. I kind of struggled at first with how to rate this novel. I am not a person that reads a ton of millennial fiction. Um, I am not a person that reads a lot of um, this type of story where it's like young girl meets older guy and blah, blah, blah. It's not usually my cup of tea. Um... But I don't know, there was something about the novel, this book, that sucked me in and I can't stop thinking about it. And I, when I put it down, I would want to get back to it. So I ended up giving it a four out of a five. Um, yeah. Anything else I want to add? There Actually, there are parts in this novel that I found really really funny like there's this character these these two girl women and they're complaining about this guy and he was like he put shoehorns in his sneakers and I thought that was funny because I am that person who uh stuffs the toe the box of my shoes to um soften the creases so I can relate sorry if that means I'm a psychopath you know but I I like to take care of my stuff anyway <laughs> um let's wrap this up so have you read Cleopatra and Frankenstein? Do you plan to read it? Um, if you were a fan of the sad girl Nava, Nava, so if you're a fan of the sad girl novel narrative, this has your name on it. Okay, not typically my go-to, but for some reason, I do tend to pick them up. So that was a bit of a contradiction, but bear with me. So if you, are you curious to read this novel? moving forward my hair is looking a little weird um but yeah I, I enjoyed it I will pick up Miller's other novels as they are as they are released and leave it at that I am going to wrap this up please feel free to like comment and subscribe if you would like to do so I would greatly appreciate it if you would like to follow me on Instagram please do I get up to more book of shenanigans over there and yeah, I do have my blog link down below. The blog is way behind. I typically use my blog as a backup to my Instagram. Um, same content. I know everybody, not everybody uses Instagram, but it's there as a backup. But it is way behind. I think the last time I updated it may have been in March or April, but it is what it is. I'm going to sign off. I am tired because I'm still in a food coma. So I'm going to sign out. Wish I had some of Santiago's rice pudding, but here we are. Ciao.